Hélène, I think you have the last word. <laughs> Please. Merci Jean-Claude. Easy slot. <laughs> bon. So I think uh, for as a macroeconomist, one underlying issue that has repeatedly come up and uh, that is a very important issue right now is why have a real rate so low? In a way, it, it underpins everything that most people have been saying. We don't understand exactly why they are so low. That constrains monetary policy massively. That is linked to the creation potentially of bubble and financial instability, and that puts huge financial risk, not only potentially in the banking sector, but also people have not talked about the insurance sector and the various types of asset managers, the pension funds, etc. So this is a really big issue. Um, now, what do we know about it? So uh, there are several uh, theories out there. Um, so one very prominent advocate of secular stagnation is, of course, Larry Summers. And uh, he will relate the decline in real rate to trends. And if he's right, then these trends are very persistent because they have to do with demography and uh, productivity growth. And of course, we can't predict innovation and all that. Uh, now, I happen to have done some research on this, and uh, I would tend to disagree with Larry Summers and to be much more on the Ken Rogoff side of things. I think that in order to understand long-term movements in real rates, one has to look at economic history, and then that's going to strike a chord with, uh, with Jeff and the 1930s. Because actually, if you look at the, the long-term pattern of movement on real rates, uh, it turns out you can link them to other macroeconomic variables quite quite closely, consumption and wealth, and consumption wealth ratios. And what you see is that uh, really the only other episode that is similar to ours today is the 1930s, right? and it's the big crisis. And in both cases, you have seen massive increase in wealth in the 1920s, that was the Russian, you know, irrational exuberance period. We have seen that since the 1980s and, and 1990s, in both cases linked to financial deregulation and all that. Then we have seen massive financial crisis, and then after the massive financial crisis, we've seen very long period of deleveraging. And people underestimate how long it takes to deliver. And I think we are still in that, in that swing, in that, in, in that period of deleveraging, and this is why the real rates uh, tend to be uh, quite low. If this is correct, that also points to a fact that, I mean, if this is correct, that, that points to that fact, but for other reasons, I think uh, this is correct as well. Fiscal policy is the right tool right now. So fiscal policy is the right tool uh, because when the interest rates are low, fiscal policy is more effective. And of course, when interest rates are negative, if you have to do investment, it's the right time to do it. Do we have to do investment? Actually, we do. Everything we have, we have told today and, and yesterday about climate change and having to uh, do a transition requires a huge amount of private investment and public investment. So we're in the situation where from a cyclical point of view, it looks like we should be investing. And for survival point of view, it looks like we actually should be investing. So everybody who says, you know, having a lot of debt or, you know, having a, a deficit right now is not a prudent strategy, I would turn it on its head. It's the opposite, which is not prudent. We should really be investing a lot. Now, how do we invest? In order to invest, we need certainty. We need you know, we need to get rid of some uncertainty, which is uh, very detrimental to investment behavior. We have a case experiment with Brexit. I won't dwell on that. But in terms of climate change, there's a lot of uncertainty. How do we go about that? What you want, and I think most economists who have worked on climate would, would agree here with me, you want a carbon price. And you want a deterministic price for a carbon price at long horizon. Okay, so here it's great that the chair is Jean-Claude, because I think there's one very great proposal, I think, out there by Christian Gaulier and Jacques Delpla, who proposes the creation of a carbon central bank, where the carbon central bank would actually sell permits, okay, volumes of permits, in order to match them, and this requires the work of, of scientists in order to be able to do that properly, but it's possible to match our target of volume emissions into a deterministic path between now and 2050, say. The central bank can intervene by selling these permits at auctions and actually hit this, this path. Now, if you do that, and of course you support it also by public investment, you may unleash a whole amount of private investment and you may actually uh, do something positive about uh, what, we, what is needed for the energy transition. Obviously, it is not costless. 
the common price will be biting. Okay, so that requires a lot of accompanying redistributive measures, etc. We know that. Energy transition is not going to be, it's not going to be costless. But this would be a way of doing it um, while taking care of the uncertainty and unleashing investment. So I think this is something that would be really worth considering. Starting it in Europe seems very uh, kind of natural, but uh, with the appropriate mechanisms at the border to deal with import contents of carbon, I think we could make progress and maybe increase the club of people uh, adopting it down the road. Nale, fantastic. Uh, do, do you publish a paper? Have you published a paper, Hélène, on, on this uh, Carbon it's, Central Bank? The Carbon Central Bank, it's not my idea. It's, a, it's the idea by Christian Gaulier, who uh. you might know is a, is, a very, is a very good academic, extremely good uh, uh, finance, insurance, he's at the Toulouse School of Economics, and Jacques Delpla. Okay. And they have published a, a short note recently where they detail exactly how things would work, and it's really worth considering and, and reading. Okay, thank you very much indeed. So <laughs> we, are, we have a very rich set of ideas, proposals, uh, I would say fears. And uh, I see uh, much more fears, uh, to be frank, and, uh, and risks that could materialize than uh, highly positive uh, elements in what has been said. Uh, only uh, two or three remarks from me, uh, very, very short. Uh, I, um, I have to say that when I look at the picture from uh, Planet March, uh, I see populism, a level of frustration in uh, the uh, fellow citizens of, as you said very wisely, uh, Jeff, all uh, advanced economy without absolutely exception, even if the modalities are different, but it's the same in the US, UK, continental Europe, uh, Japan. That's for one, an immense frustration of the population. Second, I see inflation extraordinarily low, and I cannot help making the rapprochement. I, I think that there is an anomaly in the functioning of our system, which is that the Phillips curve does not function as in the past since the crisis, and that even when you have full employment, uh, there is no real increase of the uh, uh, wages and salaries. The fellow citizens prefer by far uh, to protect their jobs instead of getting uh, augmentations of wages and salaries. And that is because they are under uh, an immense new competition constraint coming from globalization, the emerging countries, uh, and uh, science and technology, not to speak of perhaps uh, immigrants in, in their own uh, national economy. So all this makes something which is abnormal. It's abnormal in my view that in Germany you do not have, you, it's starting a little bit now, but uh, over a long period of time you didn't have what would have been expected from social partners in uh, full employment, so the same in the Netherlands, the same in Japan, same in Switzerland, same in certain way in the US with the paradox that the Republican president calls for the blue collars to get more wages and salaries, which says a lot on the overall sentiment that there is something wrong there. Uh, if they were more demanding, I'm not sure that the real wages and salaries will increase a lot because you have other fundamental constraints uh, that are uh, underlying and uh, uh, we all know that. But at least we would have unit labor cost going higher and with unit labor cost going higher, inflation would be higher. So, so I have, uh, we, we are in a Phillips curve which is Keynesian, which is no more of a, a classic, if I may, uh, Philip Kers. And, and then perhaps the central bank would be out of the fear, right or wrong, they have the fear that the deflationary risk could materialize. And this is the reason why in this environment of very low inflation, they try to get out of this trap. But and I dare myself, I, I will be as daring as Ellen was. Uh, I know what happens when the system does not function very well and when wages and salaries are permanently fixed at a too high a level. 
you engage with all partners in some kind of disinflation policy. It is what has been done in the Netherlands, in Europe, in France, after the Netherlands, and in many other countries. As a matter of fact, all countries, in order to converge towards the euro. So it was uh, social partners, government, public authorities, private sector, joint partnership to arrive from increases of, uh, say, 7 8% down to increases which would be in line with more or less the 2% of the uh, inflation target, implicit target. And I am wondering whether we would not need to deliver the central banks from the trap and all the consequences in terms of financial instability that are associated with negative rates or very low rates, whether we should not try to have the reverse consensus, if I may, not disinflation policy, but policies in a way. It is what Trump says. When he said, I'm president of the US and I want the blue colors to get more wages and salaries, it seemed, I see something which looks a little bit as the reverse of what we did. And uh, I participated myself in the disinflation policy over 17 years in my own country. And, and the euro would not exist had we not embarked in this uh, policy. So <laughs>